want to put on anybody on the spot, but if you are new, not, you just raise your hand. Okay, would you like to tell us your names? I'm Thomas Dodden. I just uh, moved back from Furman University, graduated in physics, doing astronomy. So Fantastic. Hey. You found it. Thank you for finding us. <laughs> I found you for us. Wonderful. Well, we have lots of activities for you to plug into. I'll tell you all about them. Okay. And you guys? I didn't notice uh, you were here. <laughs> That's his first time I've been. This is my daughter. Yeah. Very bad. Nice to and I'm the club member. <laughs> Family thing. I try to get my wife to come. She's not big on space. It scares her. Either. Too far. Um, <laughs> Too far. So, for those of you who haven't been here in a while, we always pass the roster around. So, uh, is the roster in here or is it still? It's, I see it. Hang on, I'll drag it. So if you've not signed this roster, just sign the roster. I'll start right here. And once you sign the roster, and if you want to join, can you pass that back to Adrian? Um, if you want to join, it, the membership fee is off the top of my head, I should know this one right here. It's twenty one, I think. If you if you join online. Online. It's twenty dollars if you rate if you're paying by check. Um, and uh, once you join and you fill out your application, you get a name badge just like you. <laughs> Sorry, totally put you on the spot. Um, yes. No name badge. No name badge. That's right. You told me that last time. And your name badge is the same place everybody else's name badge is. I have a big box. That one I got lucky on because I printed it at work today. <laughs> it was the one I had with me. Uh, <clears throat> we just like, it makes it easier for us to see who's who and you get to learn people's names. And, uh, some of us have known each other a long time and some of us have not. So. Uh, we have a online on Facebook and our website. That we're very active there on both those places. We keep up with the calendars so you can always find out what's going on and who, what we're doing and where we're going. And what the next uh, what the next topic is on, and we try to do different things, and we try to make it interesting for everybody. On the Facebook page, if you um, have it, if you're not on Facebook, we try to keep up with um, our members, and we we try to do enough information about the club so you can get a sense of where we're going and what we're doing. But we also try to talk about the uh, the topics that interest folks in astronomy. So last month we had Dr. Samantha Blair, who's right back there. Uh, to talk about cosmology, it was fascinating. It was my head hurt uh, when it was over. It was it was kind of tough to follow sometimes, and I totally started I, I started thinking about something, and I was just off. I thought it was a bit like drinking from a fire hydrant. It was like drinking from a fire hydrant. That's very good. Or dizzy bat, yeah. where you run around the bat and then you fall over. Yeah, it's like that too. Um, the, the thing that got me, and, I, and I'm, we're going to have a conversation about it, it's taken me this long to know how to ask the question, <laughs> but uh, it involves the math, and so I'll ask you later. Well, it's going to be math. math. I'll be wrong, I know, so that's why I'm not going to ask you in front of everybody. Uh, and I also, last month, I told you that I watched this amazing show on, PBS, on Netflix, and I couldn't remember what it was. Well, I went and found it. Uh, it's called The Farthest. Anybody seen this yet? Oh, you guys are in for a treat. It's awesome. They did it so well done, and... Uh, I, you know, you know the story of Voyager. I think everybody does. But to see it, it's told in such a way that it's laid out from beginning to end, of where the big, the big uh, issues were with with Voyager, and uh, it's just, it's a great show. It's on it's, right now. It's on Netflix. So you can watch it for free, uh, or you can watch it on PBS. From time to time, it pops up there. I've actually seen it on there once. Um, our members haven't posted on the Facebook page, but they've been posting pictures of their telescopes. And this is the reason for all the rain last week. This one right here. Oh. Um, and then Harold was out night before last. You'll have to tell Harold Ralph that I put his telescope up there. And also, if you remember, we sent out a newsletter, and our newsletter now it's it's um, it it's got something in it. Uh, Ralph's hop to it articles are are they're awesome. So, uh, I, if you've read the newsletter, my whole article was about his hop to it. Number three was great. Uh, sadly, number one and two, weather got me, and the nights that it was pretty outside, you know how you get. You're like, I'm not going out tonight. You have all the intentions in the world, and you don't go out. But hop to it, number four, I finished on Monday. I was on a business retreat, 
and uh, I took my telescope with me. So when everybody was asleep, I was out in the field with my telescope, uh, and it was dark there, so it was great. I got to watch. Uh, I got to go all the way through it, and it was it was fun. It's tricky though. Markarian's chain is tough. You know, I've taken photographs of it, and it's fairly easy. But when you start trying to find it in your telescope, that's that's a whole new ball game. So, uh, if membership comes with the newsletter as well. So, anybody working on anything new? I heard y'all talking about stuff. I heard camera discussions back there. So, we'll, we'll, all you Neef people, we we have a need for we have a need for we have a need for that will come up. Neef is it's abbreviated for uh, the uh, uh, North uh, uh, the Northeastern Astronomy Forum. Yes, Northeastern Astronomy Forum. You saw what I was working on. Yeah. <laughs> And um, anybody else working on anything? Ned, what are you doing these days? Nothing special. Nothing special? I don't believe that, Ned. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is, right there. <laughs> I was wondering if there's any do it yourselfers in the group. I've got the parts for, for a very heavy duty equatorial mount that I'd like to get rid of. <laughs> well, there you go. I, I actually do know a do-it-yourselfer who likes to put together old lathes. Um, so he might be sitting in front. He might be looking at you, not his head. Right <laughs> he was already way ahead of me looking at you. Like his head turned real fast when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody, anybody need this? Do we, everybody sign it? Okay, we're not going to put you on English. Yeah. Okay, uh, anybody having trouble with equipment? Bobby, I, we're going to get your, your cameras worked out, I promise. I will find some time. Uh, anybody got a new scope? New telescope? Yeah, Bobby did. Tell everybody about your new telescope. Or wait, let's talk, let's do it. Let's, why don't you do a review of it for the next newsletter? Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd be good. good. Yeah, oh. Good. But you can tell everybody what it is. Oh, I, I got a Lightbridge 16. 16 inch and, Lightbridge. Uh, I got it for far less than half price. Yes, you every did. Tag I heard what you paid every, for. Every piece of gadget you could ever get. Yep, that's why it's going to rain for two months. Well, Where'd you buy it from? <laughs> that wasn't the only thing I got. You're going to bring it Saturday night? Yes. Oh, are you? Oh, It'll be there Saturday night. Will it fit your car? Yes. Oh, really? Bobby, where'd you buy it from? Well, he A guy over in uh, <laughs> Saudi Daisy. Astro Mark? No. Yeah, how did Craig's you find list. out about Craigslist? Oh, you're Bobby. having me talk about Bobby, we need to have a discussion about Craigslist before you buy anything else, okay? Well, it was strictly accidental. So maybe, well, yeah. I well, just, I could, we should probably have like... I was a, looking for something else. Since you got me talking here, can I say something else? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Anybody is welcome to come out to my place and use any one of those telescopes I have out of the ten. There you go. And uh, and we'll work on the hopping. Yeah, the star the hopper back there. there you <laughs> so there you go. If anybody has anything that you'd like to, if you'd like to learn how to use telescope, Bobby's got several he can teach you on. Um, equipment upgrades or anybody have anything for sale? Yes. I actually have. I at the, I was at a, a three day workshop on uh, Pix Insight recently, and I, I won a door prize of this luminance filter, but I really. Don't have a use what for size it. is it? Two what inch. Is it? It's well, a two inch. Is it unmounted? Good. What is it? You can take it because I've got my sold. Yeah. Whoever wants that, I just donate it to the club. So okay. whoever wants to use that, you know, feel free to take it and use okay. it. This is uh, L Pro. I don't know what that is. Okay, so that's probably which one is it? It's an L Pro. L Pro luminous. Here you go, Miss. Let's see. Let's see what that is. That fits a two inch eyepiece. Got the regular forty two script. Weight feels to be feels to be mounted. Yeah. Yeah. I can. I can. Yeah, it fits a two-inch eyepiece. Yeah. So this would be for an eyepiece. So light pollution filter is what it is. Yeah. It's a very nice filter. Is that the LDSD one or? Uh, it is the LP. So. LP. Put it right here. Someone who's sitting trying to image. Yes. I have two items for sale. Okay. I have a Melbourne wedge. It goes with the uh, Celestron um, uh, that, you know, you can use it on any of the 8s, 9.25s, or the 11 inch. Sure. And uh, it's 350 bucks, and that's a really good price on that. And I also have a uh, 
advanced uh, VX uh, mount, still in the box, never been used. And it's got all the tinker toys with it you need to. Uh, You're talking about an AVX? Hmm? AVX? What type of mill? The VX. Okay. Anybody else? Vexen? Hmm? Vexen? It's an ABS. That's six hundred and fifty bucks. That's firm firm price on it. Okay. I might come off fifty, but then you know six forty nine fifty is right close to being six fifty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I have a planetary camera I brought. It's a ZWO two twenty four color camera. Uh, it works wonderfully on a SCT, uh, even a reflector. Uh, and the cost of the new are they're two ninety nine new plus shipping. And the first person that comes up with two twenty five is getting it tonight. So it has the all sky lens too. So I bought it three months I bought it about six months ago and then I David bought a new camera and I use David's and I like David's. It has more resolution. So I'm a nerd. I need that resolution. <laughs> so What's I the resolution it. on that one? Uh, it's, I mean, this one's equally as good. It's just a little bit different. I mean, they're almost identical. The pictures of Jupiter I took with them, it's hard to tell which one, which one's which. It's better than the, my camera. It's good for both planetaries and for... Uh, it's better for planetary than stars. But you could look at... I mean, it, globular clusters look great through it. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, so now I've asked David to come up and do a brief presentation on Neef. David, you'll come on up. I'll let you hit the. All you got to do is hit the. All right. Touch it. Neef so, was pretty good this year. There's all kinds of new stuff there. It was like Matt was saying. It was a lot better than years past. So this is Rockland Community College, and it's like the entire gymnasium is set up with. All kinds of goodness from all the vendors. What's the geographic location of this? I mean, it's it's on the border of New York and New Jersey, oh. near Mawa, New Jersey, if you know where that is. It's maybe 30 minutes out of New York City, kind of north, uh, northwest. White Plains. So, uh, one of the big new things that came out this year that everybody was kind of drooling over was this 14 inch Rasa from Celestron. Only 13,000. Only 13K. Um, but this thing had a Cost lens cell on the end of it that looked like about a five inch refractor. There's four lens elements in the end of that. It's not made for visual, it's only for imaging, but it's f2.2. It's super fast. And somebody on Astrobin posted a photo they've taken with it, and I've never seen anything like it. it the stars. It's crazy. They're just, their star color in it in the image is amazing. I'll find it and show it to y'all for a while. Yeah, it's, it's extremely impressive. I thought this was kind of cool. I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't know if people buy one of these, but. Rainbow Astro had this little mount, it's a harmonic. Nobody over here moved. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. Uh, but this this little drive from Rainbow Astro is a harmonic drive mount. This thing can carry 33 pounds with no counterweights at all, which is kind of cool. But it has a pretty high periodic error, so I don't know that you could image with this. But and it was seven thousand dollars too. But you see this thing move. And actually, it's it's pretty slick. That's why your show is so. Good. Oh, there's, two, there's two little clips in there. Pretty quiet and uh, pretty smooth. Pretty fast tracking, too. That's under a lot so, of stress. These guys, uh, watch her at Observatory at that website. They had some. Dennis and I looked around at the show, and these were like. These were some of the uh, the best photo frames that we saw at the show where these guys are. These things are actually backlit. So we turn the actually flip the switch and turn them off. They're black. I mean, you can't. There's almost nothing there. Just a little bit of an outline. You, and they, you know, when you turn them on, they look fantastic. And I'll be getting some sense from that. He actually emailed me. Yeah. And said he wanted to see what some of my images look like. He so they're not. You know, they're not just screen. selling these. You can, you know, send them your own images, and they'll turn them into these. And they've got. So it's a digital display. Or what? It's backlit. It's like a backlit LED. Mm -hmm. But they're 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 really slick. They look they looked exceptional. They really did. And those are their sizes and prices, frame and image size. So they're not not too bad. Uh, ASI had uh, ZWO had this little box, the ASI Air, kind of a cool little thing. It's actually a Raspberry Pi, and they've taken a Raspberry Pi basically and put their own proprietary software package on there. It'll it'll control their own ZWO guide scopes and imaging cameras. It'll plate solve, shoot your images, and actually interface with Sky Safari, control your mount and everything. It's pretty slick and it's like 200 bucks. Wow. So, kind of a cool little thing. You can control it with iOS and Android as well. 
Um, Dennis and I were both looking for kind of a small little portable mount. He actually bought this one and has it. I didn't. I haven't gotten it yet, but it's a CEM 25, and it's only 10 and a half pounds and carries 27 pounds. So, pretty decent little decent little mount. That's probably the best one that we could find that was small and really compact. That was pretty decent quality. How much? Uh, I think they're 8.99 new. Yeah, they're a thousand with a larger cop on. Yeah. They said so, what's the. Uh, so not bad. Three arc seconds for the they make they make an encoder version of it. Uh, that's I think it's eighteen ninety nine, and it actually has point three arc second peak to peak. So no, pretty good. These mounts, these next mounts, I love. Matt thinks they're ugly, but I think they're awesome. <laughs> the L mounts from Plane Wave. These things are just came out a couple months back. Looks like a high something range. amazing for like a home observatory. They actually make wedges for these, so you can mount these equatorially and track horizon to horizon with no flipping. They're all direct drive, so there's no gears, there's no worms, belts, nothing. It's just direct drive, zero backlash, zero periodic error, wow. and they move at 50 degrees a second, which is amazing. Starting at 10k. Starting at 10k for that one, the small one. It has a hundred pound, pound capacity. So it must have automatic air conditioning and power steering. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, for the other the other mounts on the market that are in that weight class in that that quality, they're they're actually cheaper than cheaper than other ones with encoders. The stuff from AP and and like uh, Software Bisque, they're thousands more. You know, for the same thing. So 50 degrees a second. Man, they're smoking and they're dead silent. There's not a, they make no noise whatsoever. And you can actually mount scopes on both sides of that arm. So if you want to have a small refractor on one side and something like that on the other, you can mount two and track with it. Pretty slick. I think they're, I think they're so it'll, it'll do either altazimuth or equatorial? Either one, yep. Uh, Moonlight came out with this power hub, which was, there's not a lot of solutions like this out there where you've actually got four um, DC power, 12 volt power ports, USB ports, four USB ports, and your dew heater controls all in one little box. Um, 10 amp max out power output, and they're about 500 bucks. Seems a bit pricey. It, 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 yeah. But um, Borg had these little refractors that were pretty slick. The little 90 millimeter one, they, they claim these have a 50 mil, 55 millimeter image circle, and they're both F3.9, so super fast. Flat field? Flat field, six element pets ball, so it's got a flattener corrector built in. Um, that's that's what they claim, and they're they're just starting to, I've seen like one review out from these so far, so they're starting to leak out. But, uh, the bigger one had an L, the, the main element on the end actually moves back and forth and look kind of wonky, but the 90 doesn't, so I think it's probably much better. <laughs> what were they? How much were they going for? Did not announce price. And yeah, announce they weren't out yet. Yeah. Expensive. Probably, probably on the higher end. Yeah. You have to ask. There's some awesome. <laughs> there's some awesome chips and cameras coming out. FLI uh, already has some of these chips out. QHY has theirs in development. But uh, all these new chips are coming from GPixel, which is over in China. These guys are starting to put out a lot of new chips that are going to apply and, and be great for astronomy. Where we're having a scrounge right now for some of these new CMOS chips. These guys are making dedicated. Um, monochrome ones. The 2020 is 1.2 electrons of noise, 6.5 microns, 94% um, quantum efficiency. So I mean, almost every photon hitting these things is being recorded. It's amazing. Um, and the 4040 is about the same size as the 16803. They're 9 micron pixels, 4K by 4K, so it's a 16 megapixel chip. And they support HDR mode, which I think is going to be something really, really cool. It's 52 millimeters in nine. It's the same size as 16803. They can't yeah. win, man. It'd be but the HDR stuff. mode, it reads out, CCDs only read data off the chips one time, one pass. CMOS, they can read it multiple times. So what this HDR mode does on these new cameras is it runs it through different amplifiers with different gains, a high gain, low gain, combines the two together and gives you a much broader range on your, on your uh, image, on a single image. So you can pick up, you know, bright overexposed areas and underexposed areas in, in the same image. Um, Primo Luce had these little focusers. He got one of these. Dennis picked up one of these. They're little electronic focusers. These are cool because they don't have the extra box and the extra hardware that most other electronic focusers have. It's just all self-contained. Just has USB and power and that's it. And they fit most focusers, two inch, three inch, three and a half inch. 
wide range of any kind of scope you can imagine, pretty much. <laughs> um, Which are they? 365. Oh. Which is much cheaper than most of the other ones on the market as well. So, Astrophysics announced their little 92 millimeter stowaway. Uh, this is a new little refractor. It's going to be pretty amazing, I think. F6.65. Um, and they actually corrected the flattener in, in this thing so that it's going to correct well into the violet region of the spectrum because a lot of these new CMOS cameras, for people that shoot with them, you know they tend to blow out and bloom stars and you end up with halos and stuff around bright blue stars. This is supposedly corrected to avoid that and eliminate those. But um, if you're not on the list already, it's already closed, so you can't get one. <laughs> yep. And then they had this one on display. It's a 10 inch matte cast. Uh, I think this would be a planet killer, 3,700 millimeters. This is a one of a kind, one off. They're going to be auctioning this on Astromart. If you got an extra kidney to sell. <laughs> but, um, My wife said no. <laughs> and then. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so we had a good time there. It was pretty pretty cool. There's a lot of amazing stuff this year, but it's definitely worth going if you guys haven't been. Thank you, so, sir. All you right. Thank you. All right. Yes, it's, if you've never been to Neep, I would highly recommend going at some point. It's a lot of fun. Okay, I'll try to stay over here. Uh, kind of getting down to the wire here, but June 9th to the 16th is... Uh, when some of us will be in Marathon, Texas, I'm hoping to go, but work may keep me out. I just, still don't know. Uh, but uh, they do have rooms still available. Here's the number. This is not kind of like a group thing where we're all going. It just Everybody's just going to show up there. It is a long way there. It's about 20 hours, but uh, it's worth it. We know who's going from the group? I'm I'm trying to go. No, Dennis is going, and I think that might be it. I, well, Chris Waldrop said he might come with his son, so... Um, it's a good trip. I would say you could go with me, but I have to like corral 50, 16 teenagers before I go there. So you don't want to go with me. Is this like El Paso? It's way south of El Paso. Almost all the way down to Mexico. In fact, we drove to Mexico one day when we were there. When I took that picture. Was it close to Big Ben? It is. It's about 30 minutes away from Big Ben. Okay. Yeah. So, in the checking account, I talked to Camby today. We have two thousand ten dollars and eight cents. One renewal, no new members, uh, and uh, we do have some business to attend to tonight. And I would like to invite Richard Clements to come up for just a brief. Uh, these are just one. Okay, just stand right there. Uh, all right, guys. So uh, the main meeting is elections and. <laughs> Matt called me and asked me if I could try and rustle up some people, and uh, and I did try to do that, and I got the result that I had gotten for the five years that I was president. Uh, there, I, I sent out an email, which ended up being an article in the newsletter, which I strongly recommend. It wasn't the article I was expecting to see in the newsletter, but <laughs> sorry, that's all right. It was too good. It was. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to consider that that ought to be in the newsletter every month until next year because you all need to get that message. What's that? Uh, that we, this is you all's Astronomical <laughs> Society. This is a fantastic group. But it only stays fantastic to the extent that people say, I'm willing to give it a try and help. Tom, you did that. You stepped up. <clears throat> and, uh, and Bobby has stepped up numerous times. And Matt stepped up when I got to where I just couldn't step up anymore with it. Um, but it does not matter how long you've been here. It The only thing that should matter is that you're willing to give it a try because that's all I brought to it. And if you mess up, nobody can complain because they didn't volunteer, right? <laughs> and if you think things ought to be different, that's the way we did it in the Boy Scouts, or I guess it's the Scouts now. Mm. If you don't like how it's going, good. You just volunteered to handle that. <laughs> but guys, we don't, I, I don't, Matt doesn't, Jim doesn't, Samantha doesn't, Camby doesn't, Ralph doesn't. We don't want to wheedle and guilt you into it. But, but we will if we have to. <laughs> but, uh, well, it means a lot more if you say yes choose me I will do my best and it's only for a year that's only it's only an hour a week no wait a minute that was scouts uh, <laughs> but uh, 
But please consider, seriously consider, helping these folks out next year. Now, as far as this year's elections, we're a little off the reservation with regard to the Constitution. I apologize for that. Uh, but That's my fault, because I didn't know. Well, here it I is. Knew. It was in the Constitution, but I didn't understand it. But I do, do we have the Constitution <laughs> posted on it? It is, on the website. It should be on the website. Okay, we were supposed to have a slate of officers Last month. Of, of candidates in April to be elected on sure. in May, which we did not have. <laughs> Everybody ought but to, here's what well, go ahead, Tom. Everybody ought to try being press at least once, because that's a good experience. It really is. It is. It is. You get to find out stuff and you get to meet people and do things that you wouldn't ordinarily get to do. Mm -hmm. It's like how many rangers do you know now? <laughs> a lot. That's a, no, I'm serious. I know a lot of mats too. That's a, things, like, yeah. uh, things like that. Your name has to be Matt to be president. It's like a key to every observatory that you ever yeah. Or run or run up against that close to Palomar, I guess. Do we have a, like a description of what the roles are? Mm -hmm. each they're all, they're, they're all also well defined in our constitution. Okay. It's like Article Two. You need to move it Bobby to the top of the West. You need to have oh, the, fir the first line on the web list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on, let's get this over with. So read uh, description. Yeah. Matt has agreed to serve another term. As president, Jim Amos has agreed to serve another term as vice president. Canby, who's not here, has agreed to serve another term as treasurer. And we have Samantha Blair, who uh, agreed to be our secretary. Since those were the only people on the ballot, I found no reason to kill any trees. And so I would like to move that we elect these people by acclamation. Second. I second it. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Guys, seriously, really think about it. And and I kind of look here, but I'm looking at you. You're you guys are regulars here. <laughs> don't don't think for one second that we can't use your ideas and your thoughts. You don't have to be president. We got a newsletter editor. We've got uh, a membership uh, person. There's all kinds of places you can plug in. So don't think. That just because you're too young, or too old, or too furry, or too out of town, no, Dennis is too out of town, uh, that you can't do it because you can. You can. And that's all. I better shut up now. Thank you. I just think it ought to be noted that Samantha volunteered. Samantha. Yes. Samantha volunteered to be secretary, which from experience is one of the hardest jobs to get people to do, to feel when you're on the nominating committee. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all. Uh, I, I will do my best, but I will make mistakes. Just telling you already. If, if you don't like what I'm doing, call Bobby, tell him, and he'll call me and tell me. <laughs> Save everybody a call. All right. So I don't call you. I said send you an email. Yeah, email's cool too. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've been asked. I've been wanting to get into reflection writing. I think I, since we since I have been in this society. I just felt like it would be a good place for us. And it's always been busy or we've always had things on the calendar. So I put something on the calendar for 2019 in the spring. Uh, and actually they called me back and said, well, hey, we got something this year in December. So I said, we'll do it. And um, it's an open invitation. I'll, give, I'll be giving you more information about that. But we're going to handle a big star party for reflection writing in December. So it ought to be a lot of fun. It'll probably be cold, but it'll be a lot of fun. and That's a great place to go. I'd love for us to get in over there and have, um, that could be pretty iconic for us. So, yes. So the society used to go out there and set up, because I remember. Sure. We went for, we went and did a program for Normal Park yeah. Elementary. Yeah. The fifth well, I mean, graders. I'm talking like 25, yes. 30 years okay. ago. Well, I, I remember, remember the first star party I went to. Yeah, so keep, right keep in mind, our society's coming up on its 100th anniversary. Our 95th anniversary is... Uh, next year, hmm. so uh, that's 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 a big deal, gang, and we're going to celebrate it. So uh, I'll be talking to some of you guys about it, but I, I I feel like we need to start talking about 100 now, and it needs to be big. And and I you know I'm not saying big for us, I'm saying big for this community because an astronomical society is a it's an amazing thing, and for our Chattanooga to have such a good one, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about you. Uh, we need to make sure they're aware of it, and they 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 don't. So you know. Um, 
there'll be new faces that'll come on board, and maybe somebody here tonight that's here for the first time will be a, a big part of that. And I hope that happens. So uh, just be thinking about it. But we will have a December event in Reflection Riding. Uh, do we have any updates on the dark? I know we kind yeah, of. I mean, I think the biggest thing we need to do is figure out what we want to do about land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> if you know, if we we want to uh, wait on hopefully getting a contribution from somebody, I don't know. I think I'm going to start an online uh, place for us to collaborate. Go fund me. Something like that? that? Maybe a GoFundMe? I've, heard, I've, I've talked heard. about GoFundMe. I didn't know if I want to start that for the for the group without the group's approval. Yeah. Well, we could talk about it. And we might, I'm, I'm thinking um, we might need to call a special meeting and have, have discussions along these lines for people who specifically are interested in this. So uh, we'll be in touch. Watch watch your newsletter and your emails and all that jazz. Are you talking about for a meeting site or are you talking about for an observation or both? Yes, yes, both. Uh, for, it wouldn't be a meeting site. It, it, well, I mean extended meetings, but it would be for observation, just dark site for us to go and observe from image, that sort of thing. Safe, a safe place. So uh, <clears throat> now I need. This brings me back. The newsletter was late this month, and I need to apologize for it being late. I tried to get it out early. It's just been super busy. Uh, but I also want to bring up. Uh, you might note that Beth Wallace has been our newsletter editor for the last couple of months, but she had to step away last <coughs> month. She got some uh, unexpected health concerns pop up. And it had to do with her lungs, and so they had to biopsy some lungs. So she had a pretty extensive surgery, and um, and she said it was okay for us to share. That's where Beth has been. So please keep her in your prayers. Um, she is awaiting results. I I've not heard. I know that she was uh, she was scheduled to find out, but I don't know if, if if she has found out. But that's where she's been. And also, uh, Beth had taken a lot of that off of me, so that helped me tremendously. And now I'm back to. So it's kind of juggling everything, but um, we do need to approve the minutes from April. I inadvertently sent you the minutes from March, but I corrected it. Has anybody had a chance to read those minutes? Do we have enough people to vote and accept these minutes as record? Oh, you have to read them. Yeah, I read, I read them. Okay. Read them. okay. I read them like three times, and I do still you, put the wrong. Do you need a motion to approve? Yes, the we did. I'll make the motion to approve. Can I hear a second? I think so. There we go. So the minutes are approved. Um, do I have any other business? Do I have any other business that I need to attend? To? Yes. What is reflection writing? It's the Nature Center. You familiar with the Nature Center in Chattanooga? No, no, no. Okay. I, I just, we just moved here. Okay. So it's it is it's a park right underneath Lookout Mountain. They have roughly about 60 acres, I think, tucked in there underneath the shadow of the mountain. Beautiful place, and I think it's, it's more than that. very uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more. Is it that. okay? Ma uh, ma botanical more garden in there. Uh, beautiful places to walk, but you can join it as a membership. Uh, it's, it used to be around thirty, forty dollars a year. Yes. Reflection riding is a good place for observation because it butts up against the Chickamauga Battlefield Historic Park. You know, I'm not sure exactly where the boundary lines are between reflection riding and the park, but you basically got this area that can't be developed in this <coughs> national park. It's here the truck trail. But it's it's uh, it's if you you know where the Lookout Mountain is in the distance, yeah. it's just below it. I mean, if you drive towards Lookout Mountain, you'll see signs for it everywhere. I raised another question: being at the base of a mountain, don't you lose an awful lot of sky? You lose uh, from there. We'll probably lose like the southern sky. We'll lose yeah, you lose the whole east. I mean, yeah. the whole eastern sky. Is it the whole eastern? Yeah, and you get light pollution from the railroad yard. Yeah. It's not a good observing site. <coughs> it's not. <all> <laughs> okay. Um, don't forget, you can join today. You can join online. You can, if you're if you're a PayPal person, you can PayPal your membership. You just have to fill out the the uh, application, and we'll get you your name badge. Uh, so here's some photos people have taken. I love that you guys were. You know, let me explain something with the newsletter. When I send the list out and everybody's emails in there, if you hit reply all, it goes to everybody. If you hit reply, it goes to whoever sent it, and that's why my name's the only one up there. But if you watch when sometime when we did the Cloudland Canyon Star Party, because Joe helps me with that, he's the contact, so I put his name up there and it goes to him instead. But I love that you guys were having the, the shootouts with the moon. I got like six emails, here's my shot, here's my shot. So oh, this yeah. was Kevin's, I think, and this was Bobby's. Kevin's was a little refractor, and Bobby's, maybe, I, John, one of, one of these might be yours. Did you take a picture of the moon? 
No, what you take a picture of? Jupiter. Dennis, Dennis drove all the way across the country and took a picture of a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he beat everybody here. He's got a lot of free time. Yeah, yeah. Here's my picture of Jupiter. It's blurry. It's terrible scene. It was soupy. It's pretty good. It's, yeah, it's pretty good, I thought. Yeah. Uh, here's Micah's attempt to go crazy. He's put three telescopes on one mount. So, anybody else have any comments or thoughts? Anyone miss anything? Okay, so thank you so much for being patient with me to get through all of that business. Next month probably will not be quite as extensive as that. Um, I want to say thank you to Tom Sayway. He is always so so uh, willing to come up and, and, and do a presentation. And, and it's a perfect example of people in our society being the people who teach us, like some Dr. Blair and uh, Ralph and myself and Tom and and Ned and all you who've given a given a discussion and Richard for so many years, uh, any of you can do it. And with, if you have an interest in astronomy, we'd love to hear what that is. Uh, Chris, Chris Waldrop come and ignited my love for uh, star hopping, and and then got Ralph inspired. And now Ralph's over here writing these great things, and everybody's looking at space. Yeah, and we need programs for August and October over. Samantha agrees to September. Sure. So we have two programs open if anybody would like to do so. Um, I need in August and October. And uh, the the last thing I'll say, uh, I'm going to show you I'm going to show you the next the upcoming events, and then move back. Um, Saturday, May 12th. That's this Saturday. The weather's looking good. Star party. Saturday, June 9th. June's one of those weird months where the star party is before the meeting. Usually, it's the meeting after the meeting, meeting before the star party, but not not in June. And then Saturday, June 16th, is at Cloudland Canyon. Hopefully, we'll have better weather. Um, you'll notice that on these Saturdays at Harrison Bay, we have a 15-minute discussion with the public. It's not in depth. We're not talking about cosmology. We don't want to hurt anybody in there. Uh, we don't want to do any fire hose stuff on people. What we want to do, like I, last month I did Mars Rising. I'm doing a planetary parade discussion to tell everybody, hey, all the planets are in this part of the sky. It's going to be that simple. So you could do that, any of you guys that uh, have any background in astronomy. And Ralph's going to do a class on begin beginner's astronomy. I probably worded that wrong, didn't I, Ralph? It's something like that. Yeah, Ralph's kind of, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like that. Uh, but if any of you have any interest and you'd like to take one of those Saturday nights, it's from 8 to 8.15, 8.30, and however long they ask questions, that would be a huge help to us because we like to be out there looking through our telescope too. So that would help spread the love. Um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Tom Sayway. Thank you so much, Tom. Let me do two things real quick. Everybody Some saw the program. <laughs> You're program. looking for a bruising, man. <laughs> for a second, I've got two books. Uh, they've been around for a good while. They're, probably, they're not new for probably most of you, but for some of you it may be. Uh, both of these uh, re recast star tails and uh, stalls, patterns in the sky. Both go through all the constellations, and they touch on not just the, the traditional classical mythology, but they also touch on some of the other cultures also with them. And so they're all they're all easy to read, they're well written, and they're and they won't kill you with uh, in, endless soap operas. So I'll just pass these around. Thomas, this other one out here, is that yours too? I'm sorry? This one out here. Uh, no, mine mine should be at home. Star names. Yeah, you know, that's the Allen book. Yeah. Okay, uh, one thing I always if I'm in an audience, one thing I'd like to know is the credentials of the person who's running their mouth and telling me something. Uh, I can put my credentials on mythology and astronomy very briefly and succinctly. I don't have it. I, I just don't. I'm an amateur. I was sweating that, Tom. Like that. I was sweating that. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a psychologist. I'm a retired psychologist. I was trained in the hard science branch of psychology, so I know a little bit about science and scientific mythology, but my knowledge of uh, mythology comes from books and uh, looking up at the sky and books that are going around, and my astronomy is what little bits and pieces I picked up here and there, so most of, the, most of you here know more astronomy than I do, but I do like to look at the sky. Uh, you know, I grew up in the middle of a, of a big city and I just didn't see the sky. 
significantly. And then I came, moved to Nashville and lived here. And you know, I live near downtown, so you don't see the sky. It, and so it's only been in the last few years I've been able to get out and see that it's really beautiful. <coughs> it is really glorious, in, in fact. And so you know, I like, I like uh, binocular astronomy, and I just like to put the glasses up, up and control. Oh, then at some point I like to know a little bit of why there are patterns in the sky. I like to know a little bit about the science of what I'm looking at. And I also uh, think as, as a cultural kind of thing, uh, the sky was the first mass media. And that was, it was enjoyed by people, the ancients, for thousands of years. And so there's, there's a lot of stories in the sky. The sky was used for endless purposes, not, not just the mundane stuff of navigation, but for teaching children and morality plays, or just sheer entertainment. And so, you know, so, you know, again, my credentials are minimal. If you think I've got something wrong, chances are you're right. And so, you know, I'll entertain questions. I would like questions. Questions tell me that the audience is not asleep. Uh, I have taught at a local university near here, which will remain nameless, and I really appreciate the questions because the class was asleep. <laughs> okay, all right, we're, we're going to look at the summer sky. Uh, we're going to look specifically at Scorpius and Sagittarius. This, for me, is the best time of year to observe. You've got endless stuff up there. You got the Milky Way, you got the stars. You know, you don't need a super powerful telescope. You can go out with a good pair of binoculars and see fabulous stuff. And so these two constellations really work for me. And of course, you don't freeze during this time. So I'm going to go through the mythology, and then I'm going to touch on a little bit of the science, and then I'm going to go over to a piece of software, which is well known, Starry, Starry Nights. And and try to get past some of the sterile words to some of the things that get close to what you actually may actually see in the sky. Uh, when we talk about the mythology, particularly of, of Scorpius and Sagittarius, one of the things that strikes you right well is that there's not much. There just isn't much. Scorpius is a bit player in a larger tragedy, kind of has a walk-on part, does his or her thing. I don't know what the gender of Scorpions are but does its thing and then exit right and that's the end of it. So it's got some mythology uh, and Sagittarius has some, but it's a very confusing mythology. And there isn't much modern mythology. I, I like to talk about the mass media that we enjoy now, having brought a lot of modern mythology to the table, but there's not a whole lot here. But the, but the uh, science and the beauty of, of the systems make up for that. Uh, again, this is an older representation from 1882. I couldn't get a good citation on it, but you got Sagittarius over there in the sky. You've got the Milky Way running up and down the middle. And then you've got uh, Scorp uh, Scorpius on the right, and then uh, Lupus down there. And then you've got a couple of uh, odd stuff in there. You've got a, uh, well, no, let me hold that a little bit uh, and come back to it. we got a better slide. Uh, here we have Scorpius, the Scorpion, uh, from Uranium Mirror. It's a beautiful set of cards. You can buy the cards. Uh, you know, if you like looking at colorful cards, this, this, this is something to buy. It's a little bit older one from Jameson, 1822. Uh, <laughs> Libra used to be part of Scor Scorpius. Scorpius, so his claws were actually the Libra scales. But he got scaled back, part of the pun. Uh, and Scorpius' claws got uh, shrunk here a little bit. Uh, you have lupus again down, down there. I, I do not know what the owl is. That, that comes by me. Uh, when you're looking at the sky, it's distinctive, it's obvious, and it's, it's one of the two or three pieces of the sky that is terribly obvious. Uh, that's a scorpion. I mean, that, that's, that's a scorpion. It just jumps out at you. Now, you do need a good, clear uh, southern horizon here in Chattanooga, but you do get all of it. 
We should see it in Cloudlet Canyon. Oh uh, yes. Yeah, we should have a good view. This is just an another another version of it. Uh, this is from Starry Nights. They have the uh, what they call a cultural representation, and we do have a uh, a nice scorpion here, and we got the nice trail of stars. And again, it really jumps out at you. Uh, for for those of you who don't know Stellarium, Stellarium.org uh, is a free planetarium software. It's excellently done. It's constantly upgraded, uh, and it's free. So you know, you really, really, it really, really is a very good idea to download it for yourself. There's only one little hiccup on it. There ha there are third-party sites that will give it to you free, but then they throw in some other stuff that's under the table for you. So if you're going to download it, download it directly from Stellarian.org. Or you get the Linux version like me. Uh, the, I'm sorry? Linux version. There's a Linux version. Too. Okay. Oh, there you go. Why would you want that? <laughs> <laughs> when you get, get to a uh, regular star map, you begin to see that there is uh, some good stuff there. Antares is there. M4. Uh, a globular cluster is there. And then there are some really interesting things when you get down to Moon 1 and Moon 2 and down to Zeta. There's some really nice, interesting stuff there that's visible in binoculars even. And then you get over to the Stinger, and the Stinger is a very good guide to get you over to M7 and M6, which in binoculars are really beautiful sites. It's odd that M80 is there and M81 is all the way on the other side. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of Messi, I took I a break after you made a break, right? Hey, he's French. <laughs> yeah, he's French. There you go. Messier was French. So okay. There's two different catalogs. <laughs> Scorpius the Scorpion. It's an ancient. It goes back to the Sumerians, 3500 BC. It's a large constellation. If you follow the Scorpion's body from claws to stinger, you've got about 38 degrees. So it, it's a nice long path. Is one of, it's one of the 12 zodiac constellations between Libra and Sagittarius. Uh, it is a conspicuous, you know, it's what, it jumps out at you. Uh, it's named for an insect that had a brief but important role in the story of Orion the Giant. Now, Orion is a winter constellation, so we're 180 degrees off, and that takes us to an interesting observation. Uh, the scorpion stuck stung Orion to death because of, and these are the two um, ones that you run into the most, Gaia the Earth Mother sent the scorpion to punish Orion because uh, Orion really was not a nice guy. He had some unfortunate habits and one of them was hubris, pride, he was a great hunter and he declared the intention of hunting down and killing all the animals on Earth since the Earth Mother wasn't going to allow and, and accordingly sent the scorpion to put an end to that. Now there's an alternative one and that is the goddess Artemis sent the scorpion to punish Orion for attempting to ravish her. As I say, he was not necessarily a nice guy. And there are, there are multiple other versions of this because we, we need, we, if you get into mythology, you need to be prepared for the fact that there are alternative stories. <laughs> there isn't one story of Orion. There's probably several versions and they all shade into each other. And the reason for that is all this stuff existed in an oral tradition probably for thousands of years before somebody wrote it down somewhere between 700 and 500 BC. So what we're getting now are is what was somebody thought to write down. Not all of it got written down, and not all of the stuff that got written got preserved. We're probably looking at only a very small fraction of what was common knowledge or that was even written down in classic times. You know, the burning of the Library of Alexandria. That's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, well, we the that. Gigantic trend. We know of some of great authors on various myths and even science 
only because they were used as references for somebody whose writings were saved, survived all the way down. So there's a god awful lot. So if anybody ever can invent a time machine and want to go back and photocopy the Library of Alexandria, it would be a great step forward. Be my first stop. So if you've heard different versions of what I'm going to tell you, you're probably right. Okay. Uh, this is Pashoff's little uh, field guide. And I, I always, I'm a sucker for color. But again, we have Orion here. Claws down through Antares, Scorpius. down into this region down here with Lee and Zeta. Lots of excellent stuff here. And then back around to Shaola and Lisat, which gives you a nice line right over to M7, which is, makes it real convenient for binoculars. Okay, a little bit more about Scorpion, Scorpius, Scorpion. We already talked about that. Uh, it's ancient. And there's this uh, Olcott in 1911 and Allen in 1899 basically say the same thing. The inventors of the constellation, they're referencing Sumerians or before the Sumerians, might have placed Scorpion in this region of the zodiac to denote that when the sun enters this sign, which is in the fall, the diseases incident to the fruit season would prevail. In other words, there'd be a lot of diseases coming out of mature crops. Since autumn abounds in fruit, often brought with it a great variety of diseases, and might be thus fitted, fitly represented by that venomous creature, the scorpion, who, as he recedes, wounds with a sting in the tail. Off the beaten track. So maybe they were referencing diseases. I've run across in one of the curses of civilization of urbanization, which starts somewhere around 10,000 BC and runs up to the, you know, to the Sumerians and Mesopotamians, three, four, is a huge increase in diseases simply caused by people living together. So there are lots of new diseases appear. So perhaps there are comments here, and perhaps Scorp Scorpius is a reflection of that development. Now, according to astrologers, it is the accursed constellation, the baleful source of war and discard, in part because it is the birthplace of Aries, Mars. Uh, the weather-wise thought this constellation exerted a malignant influence and was accompanied by storms. <coughs> so this is not a happy constellation. But if you're an alchemist, they regarded Scorpius as in high regard because only when the sun was in this sign could the transmutation of iron into gold be performed. <laughs> so if you're into that, you got to hold off until the fall. That's what I've been trying to do. Thomas, about the birthplace of Aries, Mars, is what's the connection to Antares, which means rival of Mars? Yes. Yes. The color. I mean, it, it, was it's as good as answer as any color. Yeah, I, I understand that, but, but is there any, since that's the birthplace, is that why they named Antares, is that why they named it that? Yeah, yeah. Just wanted the connection to, yeah, the, to the, the, the... These names were lost, were, it, it, were remember, <coughs> stuff only got written down about 570 BC. <coughs> uh, many of these names were there before that. They had to be there. And remember, the, the, the people who were keeping these stories in the oral tradition were going around to groups like this, getting up in a group and telling a story. And when they told the story, they were very cognizant of the person who was paying them and would slant the story to make him the latest grandson of whichever god that particular community <coughs> held in high regard. And so, I don't know that there is an answer to your question. Maybe there is someone, I haven't seen it. 
And so there's this vast prehistory that's lost to us, essentially. Yeah. Well, you, you gave some uh, hypothesis of why that's an uh, undesirable constellation, but uh, you didn't say why they didn't like old Ryan. Yet they oh, I will come to him. Well, okay. I'll, I'll come, come to him. Yeah. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a great looking up in the sky, but you didn't want to invite him in to save the night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're coming right to it right here. Okay, Scorpius is the nemesis of Orion the Hunter. Orion the Hunter is fall constellation, winter constellation. The relationship is represented in the night sky by the relative positions of the constellations. As Scorpius is rising, Orion is setting. So the ancients saw Orion as fleeing the scorpion who's chasing them. Now you can flip this around and look at Orion <coughs> as chasing the maidens in the Pleiades and actually is not fleeing the scorpion, but he's chasing mm -hmm. the nymphs, the Pleiades. So it depends which science you want yeah. to take. Yeah, take yeah, the scorpions yeah. is saying, hey, watch him run, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they, okay. Now, in all versions of the myth, scorpion stings Orion to death, but there is a version where Artemis, Apollo, who is the brother of Artemis, Orion got too close to, Ar to Artemis. Artemis was a maiden who didn't who avoided men, and they were getting too chummy in their honey. And Apollo, her brother, set it up, tricked Ar Artemis to shoot something way out in the ocean, which Apollo had tricked Orion to go out and swim way far away. And we go, we get into the soap opera here. So <laughs> so there are several versions here of, of this. Okay. And quoting a Robert Graves, a fellow by the name of Condus, Orion, well, everybody agrees that Orion was proud. He was the greatest hunter of all time, and he's going to kill a creature. It's either the Earth Mother sends the scorpion, or Artemis sends him because he tries to ravish her. Or here, as Zeus' his wife sends, Scorpius to sting him to death for his hubris. Uh, the other version is either Orion tried to uh, ravish Artemis or one of her maidens and Artemis took revenge or, and you go on and on and on and on and on. Now, if we look a little bit further at Orion, we see that uh, at one point he was invited to stay overnight with the, a um, king. And during the night, Orion took the liberty of either assaulting or attempting to assault the king's daughter. He's not a good house guest at all. He's not a good house guest at all. He's, got, he's chasing the communities. He's getting too chummy or even attempting. Well, I think Scorpius must be a good thing here. Well, but, you, but we've already characterized Scorpius as kind of insane. But if, if we kind of step back here, and this is strictly me speaking. I have not found some scholar who comments on what I'm going to talk about here. You've got two of the showiest constellations in the sky, Scorpius and Orion, but they're not named after real heroes. They're named after unsavory characters. A scorpion that'll kill you. Orion who has a thing about women. <laughs> you know, how does that make sense? You, you would think Hercules, Hercules, is a real hero. I mean, he does all kinds of, they would have made that constellation and called it Hercules. Now they kind of give him one that's kind of hard, at least hard for me to trace. I don't have a good answer. <coughs> but it is, it is odd that your two showiest constellations on the opposite sides of the sky are named for lesser creatures. You know, you got Percy Scepter, a hero, you got other heroes, but goodness. So I don't have a good answer. Um, this is off an ancient Greece vase. They, you know, they, they had a thing about uh, scorpions. They were well rooted. And that's a real one. Clearly, you're not going to pick it up. 
Dennis would Dennis would pick it up. A minor quibble with the previous. Uh, sure. With the previous uh, screen. Uh, this one, but yeah, they would know it's referred to it as an insect. It's a arachnid, more like a spider. Yeah. Okay. It has eight legs. Okay. You're way ahead of me. <laughs> Insects have six. Okay, so it's not an insect. No. It's an arachnid. Yeah. It's an arachnid. It's akin to a spider. I got a C in biology. A spider said it two <laughs> Twice. Spiders have four. Daddy long legs is not a spider. I didn't say anything about daddy long legs. Just in case. No. When you get, you know, I like to I like to put in the Renaissance paintings and modern paintings as representative of of this stuff here. But Iran is not was not popular among the classical paintings or any of them. It is hard to find paintings, classical paintings or modern paintings of Iran. So I had to go to a children's book <laughs> to get the battle with the scorpion. And this is actually from an astrology site. <laughs> but they did a pretty good job of it. There's Artemis and Apollo on the left. And this is, uh, this is uh, I, couldn't get, I could not find the reference to it, but it's a wood engraving from a couple hundred years ago, probably. But that's about it. There's a couple of, a couple of others, but not much. Uh, this, this is a, a modern representation, I think, off an astrology site. Looks like Walt Disney. Pilates or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, one really good painting. This is the Death of Orion. Oh, this is a classical artist. Oh yeah, this this is a, this is just kind of, What's depicting here is, however Orion gets killed, whether it's accidentally by Artemis shooting with an arrow, or yeah. a scorpion getting him some way or another, sent by a variety of people. He's dying. The great physician Aesculapius is powerless to save him, and Artemis is coming over to uh, make sure he's dead. <laughs> make sure he's dead, or to grieve over he's dead, <laughs> which you know, whichever version of the story you want. She's got a little. Moon sign on her because sometimes she's associated with with the moon. This is how I feel after I stay up all night with my telescope. <laughs> Does our news come down? Orion or you don't want any of it? <laughs> okay, let's switch over to Sagittarius. A couple things to to note here that he uh, it. Well, in these later representations, Sagittarius is portrayed as a centaur, half <coughs> human, half horse, and Sagittarius is always <coughs> represented with a bow and arrow, because it is Sagittarius the archer that's emphasized. However, well, let me chase this. This is how Starry Knots, uh, I've got Starry Skies, that's, my, that's a typo, Starry Knights. So they got a pretty, if, if you can look at Sagittarius and see a centaur, we could probably bring some of my psychology skills <laughs> to bear with you. <laughs> I, I just don't get it, but yeah, there's the arrow. Well, they didn't have tea kettles when they invented this stuff. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, that's uh, mm -hmm. the sort of stellarium. It's a guy with a bow and arrow and the body of a horse, right? And Johann Bode, 1801. Uh, to drift here just a little bit, we got the Southern Crown, which is a real nice binocular sight, six, six stars and a nice little crown. Be easy to find from there. I have a question. Sure. It, it, uh, this all started 3,500. <coughs> Were the stars, uh, does anybody know what they looked like then compared to what they looked like now? Maybe it looked more like that then. Very simple. Okay, who, who really knows about 
was it with the technical terms procession? Yeah, they wouldn't make any difference with the storm. Yeah, yeah. You can go back and get it on the I think also like there had been over a few thousand years, I think something in the proper motion of the stars seems to look different. And I think there there's some study about what this, those guys did look like. Right. Uh, I've seen great. references. It would, be, it would be some difference, but not huge. Right, yeah. You'd have to have a telescope to measure. Yeah. They didn't have telescopes. Yeah. Now, I've seen references to studies that have been done by winding the clock back and trying to pinpoint where the name what yeah, geographic like area yeah. would, the stars would be in that position to give the yeah. characters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, in, in what, 5,000 years, the session doesn't do that much, I don't believe. Two constellations. Okay. Well, one thing is the sun's not in the constellation that the oh, yes. zodiac says it is. I'm yeah, sure. right, that's Which like the creates a real problem for astrology. Yeah, yeah. Well, here are the two of them. There's Scorpius on the right, and then if we take follow the body of the Scorpius around. <laughs> through the jewel box, and I'll come back to the jewel box. The jewel box is beautiful. And then come back up to Shalwa. Shalwa will take you in a nice straight line over to M7, and it's easy to get to M6 with binoculars, and then you're in the center of the galaxy. Pete, did you remember <coughs> the jewel box? <coughs> yeah, I think I did. I thought you did. <coughs> Pete has a picture of the jewel box. Uh, one of Pashoff's, um, they never connect the teapot. <laughs> and I've got, I've got to say, <coughs> several years ago when I first got into this, you know, I, I did all the right stuff. I, I had Stellarium up and I studied it. I got the maps. I picked all the ones I was going to get. And I got my binoculars out and I got my chair out. I went out and I got all my stuff together, I had my red light, flashlight, I had the whole thing, and I sat down and, and I studied all, studied the maps and the hash off and swear it, and I get out there and I sit down and I look up in the sky with my binoculars and there were no lines. Thank you, government, I'll do something. Maybe they did. <laughs> All right. The mythology of Sagittarius the Archer is very confused, particularly in the er earliest uh, of the ancients. Uh, it's a, it again is an ancient constellation back, back to the Sumerians, one of the 12 zodiacs. Some say is a phrase that mythographers like to use. Some say that it represents Chiron, the centaur, he was also found in the spring constellation of Centaurus. Some say he gets two constellations. Others, however, say that the constellation represents Crotus, the son of Pan, the satyr. The satyr is a half human and half goat. And the personalities of a centaur and a satyr are entirely different. Entirely. Now, Crotus's claim to fame is that he invented archery, hence the, the bow and arrow, as he enjoyed hunting, and Zeus put him in the stars as a reward for his invention. But Crotus is a set, set, setter. While modern sources depict Sagittarius as half man or woman, there are female centaurs. And half horse, the old Greek sources, as I said, are confused, depicting Sagittarius as a centaur or a satyr. And we said satyr is thought to represent Chiron. However, centaurs in general were thought to be clannish, difficult, warlike, and often thoroughly obnoxious. And we will come to the height of their obnoxiousness. Now, Chiron in particular, whether he was a centaur or really a maybe a satyr, was the opposite. He was the quiet, peace-loving, wise, just, first in music, and he was immortal, so everybody liked him. 
But if he was Crotus, son of Pan, we're into the Satyrs, and Satyrs were also big time party guys, or party animals, depending on which part you emphasize. <laughs> Music, drink, and nymphs for their reasons for existence. <laughs> were, weren't they associated with Bacchus? Uh, definitely. And then for the term Bacchanalian? Yeah, oh, well, definitely. They were the ultimate symbol of male sexuality. And the ancient Greek depictions of satyrs are XXA. And I had to, after looking at a few of them, I thought, I cannot show these in public. Mm -hmm. I cannot do that. I just cannot do that. I just don't. So that's what I took out. Okay, but common whether it's a Saturn or a centaur is the arrow, notch for release. Now the arrow was thought to menace either Scorpius, with everything right at Scorpius, or to menace Taurus the bull, who's on the other side of the zodiac. So we're back into that same situation we had with Sagittarius, excuse me, the scorpion being the nemesis of Orion, now we have the Centaurus, excuse, uh, Sagittarius, excuse me, Sagittarius menacing Taurus the bull on the other side <coughs> of Orion. Ah. Mm -hmm. Again, as Sagittarius is rising, Taurus is setting. And I'll come back to that. Uh, there is a spring constellation, Centaurus, it's hard to see here. Uh, it has some nice things in it. You've got to go down the floor to see it better, though. And it's still hard there. Come to my house. Excuse me? Come to my house. Oh, yeah? Are you? Do you have a good view of Centaurus? Are you pretty high yes. elevated? <laughs> good. Um, again, there are problems finding uh, good paintings. This is a modern representation. Uh, this is Firenze the Centaur from Harry Potter. Uh, Firenze was, is uh, the good centaur. Uh, he pursued a life of more academics. He was hired uh, to teach at Hogwarts the School of Wizardry and Magic because he could do divination. And centaurs are also sometimes thought and mentioned as being able to read the future. So Firenze the uh, centaur makes it to Harry Potter. Uh, this is a, I do not have the reference for this one, but this is Chiron, the centaur, tutoring Achilles, the great warrior from the I Iliad, tutoring him on the finer, finer arts of uh, music. Well, this is pretty old painting here, isn't Oh, this is a wall painting. I wouldn't be surprised if this was from Pompeii. Wow. I don't know that because I couldn't find the reference for it. A lot of images you get on the internet don't have citations. Uh, this is from Harry Potter. There is the, the bad centaur, which is Bane. And, and he's, uh, the coloring and all this makes it clear. You can see how far I've had to reach to get representations of centaurs. <laughs> Down to the Harry Potter. Yeah, that's pretty sad. Uh, this is an, an ancient Grecian bowl. Uh, her, this is where Heracles, Hercules, is fighting the centaurs, because again, the centaurs are not nice people, people, um, whatever, creatures. Okay, this is where you have to enter your password. So to continue, if you've forgotten your password, you just need to close your eyes for the next few minutes. You are lady centaurs. This is from Roman Tunisia. This is a wall painting. Uh, centaurs were bad on uh, courting their future brides by kidnapping them. <laughs> and the ultimate, Hippodamia's wedding. This is one of the few things where the classic painters really got, got going on. Uh, Hippodamia, the, the name actually means centaur tamer, which is a little bit odd given the events. Uh, and Hippodamia's family was given to a, um, 
a lot of uh, chaos. And we'll, we'll quote here. Her father, Atrax, the son of the river god Peneus in Burra, he was the founder of the city of Atrax named or Atresia in Thessaly, which is northern Greece. He had three daughters, Hippodamia, who we're going to talk more about, Canis, who transformed herself into a male and became Caneus, and then Amosippe, who was married to Cassandras of Thrace, but she fell in love with Cassandras' son from his first marriage, Hebrus, but Hebrus rejected her advances so she took revenge on him by falsely accusing him of seducing her, which caused Cassandras to try to kill Hebrus. But Hebrus threw himself into the river Rhombus, which was subsequently named after him. So there is one way to get a river named after you. <laughs> uh, and there is a lot of um, soap opera here. So it's a family with soap opera, which now brings us to Hippodamia's wedding. Her, her, uh, Husband was the Perithus, king of the Lapites. This is a tr tribe in Thessaly, which is actually recorded in the Iliad. Uh, the Lapites actually sent uh, soldiers and ships with the invading Greeks to the Sea of Troy. So there's probably some his actual history here, perhaps. Now the centaurs were invited to the wedding of Hippodamia and Pirithus. But only he, because they were kin. Only because they were kin. And it, <laughs> well, you had to. More, yeah, you reason. have to. Yeah. Certain relatives you got to deal with regardless. Uh, because they were both descended from Apollo. They should have never opened the bar. They should never have opened the bar. Exactly. The centaur <laughs> promptly got drunk. And being a nasty, a nasty temperament, to start with, they tried to abduct Hippodamia. Uh, and the other women, and the boys, <coughs> for the purposes of raping them. A brawl ensued, <laughs> which actually escalated to a full-out war. Uh, Theseus, the hero, jumps in to help the Lepides, and they actually uh, rescue the victims, but they don't say what point. Uh, eventually, the uh, centaurs were expelled from Thessaly and forced further north. Rightly so. Uh, this is uh, the leader of the centaurs arriving to the wedding. Hippod Hippodamia is actually greeting him and he's being a good polite. And, and this is from Pompeii. They, they dug this one up then, I guess. They dug this one up. <laughs> I don't know that this one does real well here, but you do get view here. There's a god awful lot of chaos here. Uh, there are women being pulled both ways by a centaur and by a, a lapide. There are people using clubs and bowls, beating and I mean this this is mayhem to the nth degree. With one exception. Right in the middle There is a centaur who is laying down, has laid down his spear, and there is a female centaur with him, and they are making out. <laughs> with all this mayhem and chaos and murder and violence and blood and whatnot, in the center, the <laughs> artist puts a couple making out. Yes. You know, if you think of the legend of centaurs having come from horse soldiers who rode so well, they seem to be part of their horses, mm -hmm. then you basically have roughneck cowboys doing all the bad things that are attributed to the centaurs, and it all makes sense. Yep. Uh, you know, my background, family background. The people who can't ride horses as well are insanely jealous, so they create these half-man, half-horse monstrosities to blame their enemies for being monsters instead of just being more skilled. The riding horse and raiding. So, yeah, there's a point to be made there. Looks like a frat party to me. <laughs> <laughs> a serious frat party. They were 
<laughs> with, a, with a scrum right in there. <laughs> now this theme is popular. There are multiple ver versions of classic, classic and more recent paintings of Hippodamia's wedding. I guess it was one of those things you, you really had to be there. <laughs> and a little bit more of the, the violence comes out in this. Uh, uh, people holding pot, getting ready to bash somebody with a pot, uh, various clubs, and the may just gen general mayhem comes through here. It's like a direct, it's like direct <laughs> being wedding. Uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> wedding? Yeah, don't ever seen the Dothraki wedding? In Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, it's like, more like the red wedding. Yeah. Oh, the red wedding. Yeah. This is this is unorganized. They were kind of organized, if I remember correctly. Both uh, the Dothraki and the uh, red wedding were organized. So this this is just chaos and mayhem. And one more. And if Hippodamia, the centaur is trying to carry her off. And again, there's a uh, lapite on the right there holding in his hand, holding a jug or a jar getting ready to bash someone. <laughs> okay, let's go over to satyrs. We've seen all the violence we want to see. Let's jump over to a satyr doing his thing. <laughs> and so satyrs in the frolicking from 1873. And we do have the goat appearance. We got some little horns, got the male upper body, and got the goat legs. And we're <coughs> again getting into the uh, R, R, and X parts here. And a nymph is getting catching a nap, and Satter is giving some thought to what he's going to do next. <laughs> Uh, Satter and then for play, these are wood, wood engravings. Is, it, is that by Albert Dewar? Or, or could, could be, but again, I could not. Is that going to date on No, it, it, it's got something written on the oh, top, okay. but I, can, I, can, I, don't, I can't decipher it. It's like Arabic numbers. No, that's not, it's not really his style. Uh, Augustino Caracci was a famous painter. He, did a lot of religious and other <laughs> art, but he moonlighted as a no, <laughs> as Galileo moonlighted as an astrologer. You got to make some money. <laughs> this is from the Roman era. You got a nymph, and again, notice the satyr is not represented with the goat legs. So if you want a party time, we want to talk about satyrs. If you want to get into mayhem and chaos, then you want to think centaurs. And there are lady centaurs also. Centaurs. Centaurs. Excuse me, centaurs. Okay, now. If we were out in the stargaze, and I just said all the stuff I was just that's what you're saying. One of you would look up in the sky and you would turn to me and you would say something like this. What are you talking about, Sally? Centaurs, satyrs, nymphs, arrows, fighting, fertility symbols, kidnapping, rape? Are you serious? For God's sake, Sayway, just look at it. It's a teapot. <laughs> Like that, I'm 
Teapot. And there's the teapot. And the teapot position with the Milky Way running right through it. Not called a steam coming out right. of the spout. Or, or falling over and tea coming out. Or milk coming out of the spout. More tea. Well, more milk. Steam. Well, we come to an odd issue, and we've already, I've already alluded to it. And this is peculiar situation where you're going with Scorpius and Sagittarius being paired with constellations on the exact opposite side of the sky, Orion and Taurus. And this is the pairing. Scorpion is chasing Orion. You're going to kill him. And you got Sagittarius who is warding off the bull. You know, how in the world does that make sense? Why did the ancients pair those? And here's my guess. This is National Geographic's representation of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is flat, you know, that's, that's spiral. We are here, downtown Milky Way, the boondocks. In the winter, we're looking <laughs> this way at Orion and Taurus. In the summer, we are looking this way. So, are the ancients hinting that they have some idea of what the Milky Way is? I'm making this up. I don't think so. <laughs> they were not done. Yeah, it's more they were like bright guys. They had their eyes on. They're setting and rising. Setting and rising? Yeah. All right, it's coincidence. <laughs> So it does make a little bit of sense. It's setting and rising, and you're looking at rich parts of the sky. That's my two cents. All right, notable objects in Scorpius. The center of the Milky Way, Antares, Messier 4, uh, Mu 1 and Mu 2, Double Star. Uh, open Cluster 623, Zeta Scorpius. So, okay, I'm, I'm kind of going. What's our, what are we doing on time? Are we about done? Okay, I'm, go, I'm going to go too fast because most of you, got, most of you know this. Some may not. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, spout almost points to the center of the Milky Way, but it's unfortunately obscured by a dust cloud. So, so much for that. Antares means like, like Mars, considered the heart of the scorpion, one of the four royal stars of Persian astrology. Pointing at the four points in the 360 degree sky, and the four royal stars tend to sit by themselves. Uh, it is also one of the four white horses featured in the chariot race in Ben Hur. Look how big it is. Uh, 604 light years away, it's a good, dis good distance, definitely, definitely bright. It's a super giant. Total energy output is about 65,000 times that of our sun. Remember our sun is a dwarf. It's an old star, it is expanded, it's, its hydrogen is, is gone. It's expanding, it's cooling. It's got a partner, which is a class B star in, 25, in a 2500 year orbit. And it's going to go supernova soon, which could be tomorrow or it could be a million years from now. So it doesn't hurt to go outside and look and see if it's <laughs> moved on. In terms of size, I always like these. There's Antares on the right. There's Betelgeuse and Orion. We drop down to Aldebaran in Taurus, Rigel, Arcturus, Pollux, Sirius, our sun rates one pixel, and Jupiter is invisible, and we are of no consequence whatsoever. <laughs> okay, the cat's eye, the globular cluster in Messier 4, easily found one degree west, west of Antares, about the size of the moon, 
that's what the book claims. I always think it's smaller. Uh, it's hundreds of thousands of stars, <coughs> tightly packed. It's very old, 12 billion years old, metal poor, so it's because it's very old stars. It's a long way away, 7,200 light years, except it's the closest one to us at 75 light years. Uh, it is known to have one planet. I'm impressed with that kind of astronomy. That's, you can, from here, go 75 light years into a jam-packed cluster and pick out a planet. That, that's mind-boggling. You can, uh, there is a average of 1.3 stars per cubic light year as compared to Earth, which is 0 0.003 stars per light year. So if you're standing on a planet, you, there's no night. You've got stars everywhere. <laughs> and to say nothing of the radiation on us. <laughs> we have to go to people who are smarter than me for sure to ask, can you have life in the middle of a globular cluster? Nice picture. I'll move one and move two, a nice double. And that's probably 500 light years away. They're both both hot, beyond hot blue stars, about both about fourth magnitude, both bigger than Earth. Uh, Mu two, it puts out about 2,300, 2,400 times the luminosity of, of our sun. So they're really big stars, uh, and they are right here. So we're coming down. Yeah. And this whole area is just really nice in binoculars. And can you can you resolve those with binoculars? Yeah. Um, and you see 6231 open cluster, so we're dissipating, very young, only 3.2 billion years old. O and B stars, big stars, short lived, very hot, 150 light years away, traveling directly at us at about 77,000 miles per hour. Uh, we have enough time to do something about that and get out of the way, perhaps, because we've got about 50,000 years. And look, I assume we'll be somewhere else by then. Uh, and that is it on the right. Is that before Andromeda gets here? Yes. Well, Andromeda is, going to, is coming later because it's okay. two, what, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half million light years away. Yeah, it's, it's five billion. And it's going to be like two ghosts yeah. passing well, through each other, years, except for the tidal effects. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll be somewhere else. Ah, uh, Zeta, Scorp, 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 oh. it's a double, but it's an apparent double. Uh, but, it's, but Zeta 1 is 5,700 light years from here to still have a 4.6, 4.7 magnitude is impressive. It is thought to be one of the most massive stars in the Milky Way at 60 solar masses. Total energy output about 1.5 million times that of our sun. And I've noticed one thing about these statistics, they tend to vary from author to author. But they're all impressive and I think we can understand getting precise data on something 5,700 light years away is a fabulous accomplishment even if there is some error. It's, it's young, it's only a few million years old, it's going to blow up in a supernova soon. Uh, Zeta 2 is closer to us to four. Uh, let's get over to here though, the false comet. This is 6231 and then you've got three other people goes out to a comet. And this is Zeta Scorpion. So you've got this nice, and you go up here to uh, Mu 1 and Mu 2. So find this in binoculars and then trace this up. That's pretty neat. That's the jewel box. Uh, Shala and Lestat. Uh, Shala means the raised tail or stinger. Lisat means the bite or the spot. Uh, Shallow is a triple star system, a bunch of bees, 
Uh, they're really big stars, producing radiation and luminosity far, 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 far beyond this. But the real value of them is they act as a pointer to M7. So you're on your way. So it's nice for star hopping with binoculars. M7, M7 <coughs> is just beautiful. A very nice binocular object. And M6 is uh, close by. M7, <coughs> the greater uh, Sagittarian star cloud, and M6. And you're there. <coughs> M7 is tall mains. It's only about 80 stars. I'm going to hurry through these six because most of you know this. I've discovered 1654. It's really far away, M6. It looks smaller. It's not as impressive as M7. Um, 300 stars, but only 80 are easily seen. Mostly B stars. Only about 100 million year, years old. About. Uh, from, M7, it's easy, easy to get to. It's only 40 degrees away. Uh, notable objects in Sagittarius, the teapot, the lagoon, <coughs> and it's well-known trifid. Trifid means three lobes. I thought it meant some strange plant-like alien creature that invaded England. But that's a different story. The small mag, uh, Sag Sagittarius star cloud in 20, the large one, and on and on and on. It is a great part of the sky with binoculars to simply troll. Just lay back in the chair with your binoculars and just troll. Mm -hmm. there's, there's how they line up. <coughs> I'm going to skip the rest of this. This is well known. I do want to do one thing though. Starry nights. Uh, this is light in the sense of frozen it, but this is the same area we've been talking about, Scorpius and Sagittarius. This is their representation. I understand from the notes that uh, these are actually photographs that people like you guys have done. Is, is this commonly used? Is this people commonly know about Starry Nights? It's about a hundred dollars. Comes in different versions. The more bells and whistles cost more. The cheaper versions cost less. It's really nice. It's got the satellites on it in motion. It's really nice. So, so, so is Stellarium. Yeah, Stellarium. Just as just as good. I will stop right here. Star Walk is a good. I like Star Walk too because I can real time hold it, hold it up to the sky and locate. But we were trying to shoot the Milky Way last night and, and uh, I knew roughly where it was going to come up at. But uh, when I held the, the, my map up to the sky, there was my there was uh, Jupiter up there, uh, Scorpio in the middle, and Saturn was coming up. From the, from the bottom, there was, there was the horizon. We just kept waiting, waiting, waiting. All we saw was cloud because the cloud covered the Milky Way last night. This is great pictures of the Saturn and, and Jupiter, Milky Way and, and uh, Scorpio, but the clouds covered the poor old Milky Way. Out yeah, Mother Nature is yeah. bad about that. We do have Jupiter here. This is tonight. I froze it on tonight. There's Jupiter and here's. Saturn, there's the ecliptic. And, and this is the fun part, and the reason I, I like to do these programs and I like, I like astronomy is this stuff is beautiful. It's just it's beautiful. And right now, if you look at Saturn, M22 is right below it, almost mm -hmm. in the same field of view. Yep. It's a great, great, great sky. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> May I, uh, like, Correction, I hope it is. Sure. I keep hearing. 
you know, I gave talks in planetariums and we did a lot of jokes about different things in the sky. And one of the course is Beetlejuice. And it's not Beetlejuice. What are you asking for? 225. And it's brand new.